Thank you, Elaine. So welcome everybody to the second day of Heritage Week and off to great start yesterday. And I know we will certainly have a wonderful talk again today um, with Stephen Seaman, who's our ground supervisor. And Stephen has been with us for almost 10 years here at Maynooth. So he has a wealth of knowledge and experience. And I would say that during the lockdown, it's been so wonderful to have these grounds to go around. And um, that's all thanks to the work of um, Stephen and indeed Father Milani for uh, allowing access during the period. Now, um, I, uh, thank you for coming and thanks Elaine for organizing all this. If you've got questions, you can put them in the chat box or you can wait till Stephen's finished speaking about 25 minutes or 30 minutes or so, and then he'll take questions. Okay, um, I think I'll hand over to Stephen then without any further ado. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Elaine. Yeah, that's great. Um, just got to leave my camera on for a minute so you just see a face to the to the voice while we're going through the slides. So yeah, it's an absolute pleasure here to, to be talking to you all today. Big thanks to the, the library staff, to Helen and Elaine and the extended crew for, for doing this for Heritage Week. It's great to be able to just kind of chat to you all in, in this kind of semi-lockdown state that we're in at the moment. So um Look, I'm going to bore you for the next half an hour about uh, the natural heritage that we have here in the Moot campus. So I'll just get this slides up here. So, um, so as Helen said, my name is Stephen Seaman. I'm the ground supervisor of the Manute campus. Um, today I'm going to be giving you just a short presentation about protecting and enhancing the natural heritage that we have here on the Manute campus. Um, so. So basically, so about the campus. Uh, the campus is home to two organizations, uh, St. Patrick's College Renute and Minute University. Uh, it's about 181 acres in size. We've about 12,000 students on the campus in normal circumstances. The campus has been very quiet in terms of uh, staff and students on it over the last kind of 18 months. But uh, as Helen mentioned, we were extremely busy welcoming a lot of our kind of our local um, people from Minute and beyond to the campus as we remained open as a very important green space for people to come and enjoy uh, throughout the lockdown. So we're divided into two campuses, as I said, divided Bill Cock Road, and we have six full-time staff members, ground staff, that look after the campus on a, on a weekly basis. Um, as for the two campuses, is very much uh, the ultra modern Minute University side, which is North Campus, which has the more modern side of the buildings. And then we have St. Patrick's College, which has the old 200 year plus um, old building. So each campus has its uh, strengths and weaknesses, opportunities. Um, and I'll just be going through a few different areas on the campus that we manage today. So what is natural heritage? So natural heritage comprises of all aspects of biodiversity, from flora to fauna, ecosystems to geographical features, everything from the microorganisms in the soil to the bees, to the birds, to the mammals, to the waterways, to the mountains. So we have a diverse ecosystem here on the campus, which is an intertwined group of living organisms which live in the Pacific environment together. So everything from the smallest microorganism to our birds of prey, they all play a vital role in creating a vibrant ecosystem here on the campus. So over the next few slides, I'll be talking about the practices that we've put in place to try and enhance the, the campus and try and make a more biodiversity um, friendly campus in terms of bringing our pollinators back onto campus, bringing our birds back onto campus and bringing our mammals back onto campus. So we'll be looking at the practices that we've put in place, the changes that we've made and the kind of the future and where we're going in the next kind of 10 years. So what are we trying to do on the campus? So this is a picture of the two different striking sides of the campus, the ultra new and the old. So we have two very different kind of styles of campus. Um, so what, I have a kind of a three-pronged approach in terms of maintaining the campus and how we're trying to move towards a more friendly, uh, more towards um, wildlife and nature um, and kind of promoting those uh, key areas. So the three areas that we like to, that I like to look at is uh, reduce, create and protect and educate. 
So these are three kind of core areas that I feel are very important in being as successful as we have um, in getting where we've got to so far. So reduce. We've been looking at actively reducing how we maintain the campus. We've been reducing our mowing regimes on the campus, allowing large areas as to grow as meadows, which is reducing our emissions as we're not running diesel machines on it. We're cutting our labor costs because we don't have as many um, we don't have as many um, labor hours of, of maintaining these areas and we're providing valuable feeding ground for um, insects and birds and we're reducing the amount of weed killer, the amount of pesticides. We're basically reducing our interaction on the campus itself, which is allowing us to kind of uh, allow the, the campus to rewild slightly. So the next stage of the thing is kind of creation and we're like to creating habits, uh, habitats. So not only should we be reducing our maintenance practices, but we should be creating new areas for our birds, our bees, our mammals, our, our flowers to be able to grow and thrive. So installing bird boxes, creating meadows, picking native Irish trees and shrubs, changing flower schemes for pollinators, all these sort of things weigh in heavily in promoting our campus into being a more kind of sustainable um, environment for these uh, flora and fauna to try, thrive. Um, and the most important thing that I find in, our, in the three-pronged approach is to protect and educate. Um, so we have to protect what we have on the campus and, and by looking at areas just for wildlife, allowing nature to thrive without any interaction. So protecting what species we have here and making sure that they're here for the next generation, but also to educate our up and coming environmentalists, whether they be students, staff, teachers, students from um, the primary schools, local primary schools. If we can educate those people that we're passing on the beacon to them in years to come, that's my job done. So if I can get a primary school in to look up a tree and see a bird box and they ask the question, what's that? That my job is done, that, that, that they are getting an interest in the environment and in nature and we're kind of passing the torch, so to speak, to the next, the next uh, cohort of people. So when we look about reducing kind of uh, what we're doing, this is uh, two of my favourite kind of pictures from years ago. This is um, on the left, this is a picture of me from about five or six years ago, me in my full get up COVID-19 gear almost, um, with the full respirator, full spray suit, gloves, the whole lot. And we would have blanket sprayed the whole campus with a lot of uh, glyphosate weed killer. And, um, and equally on the picture on the right, we would have had intensely mowed areas on the campus that were mowed on a weekly basis. The place looked immaculate. There wasn't a weed, there wasn't a, a, a blade of grass out of place, but these actions that we had, this maintenance practice that we had was having adverse effects on our pollinators and our kind of the biodiversity of the campus. So we've taken some changes to make sure that we're kind of striving away from blanket spraying of weed killer and stuff like that. So we've introduced this new oil-based weed, weed killer system where before we would have been applying over 500 litres of mixed weed killer um, around the campus. And for the same area, we're using only 10 litres. So we're doing, we're only spraying weeds in a much more targeted and reduced fashion and where is necessary. Whereas before it was very much a proactive kind of reactive almost spraying regime. Now we're just doing it if it's totally necessary and we'll explore other elements if, if, if that's the case. Um, and another aspect of um, reducing is reducing our mowing capability. So the picture on the right shows the meadows at the back. Um, so we've simply allowed those areas to grow and we've grown them into uh, meadows that are only cut once a year. And um, they're like kind of green deserts, I suppose, so to speak, before. But now they're just a vast array of flowers and uh, wildlife using them. Um, and just to kind of add on to that, just a couple of weeks ago, we took uh, the arrival of our new zero turn electric mower, which is kind of um, feeding into not only are we trying to promote the campus for biodiversity and we're trying to do it in a much more sustainable way. So we're allowing the grass to grow. We're not running as much machines on it. And the machines that we want to use going into the future are electric so that we're being uh, a carbon neutral output in the, in, the co in the coming years. So our new way of thinking. So we've taken the decision to reduce our mowing regimes right across the campus. 
So we're al allowing large tracts of grass to grow and we're, re and we're cutting winding paths through the meadows to allow easy access into the meadows for people to interact with them all. Um, so like I said previously, we be, would have been using our diesel guzzling machines to cut these meadows um, on a weekly basis. Um, but now they're only being cut once a year, baled, and they're given for food for cattle. So not only are we reducing our mowing costs, we're reducing our emissions, we're creating feed for animals, and we're cre increasing biodiversity. And by the pictures you can see in front of you, we're, we're creating vistas like this. And all these pictures here, bar one of the pictures in the middle, these are all seeds that were in the seed bank, the natural seed bank of Kildare. So it's a win-win scenario. Not only are we reducing our, our costs, we're, we're creating habitat for biodiversity and it's keep, keeping my labor costs down, way down. So it's a win-win for us. So this is um, this slide is real thanks to uh, Dr. Gail Maher, who is, uh, as I said to her in the last uh, pre the presentation, she's the, the godmother of uh, Wildfire Meadows on the campus. Um, myself, Gail and Jim Carlin were kind of uh, very, Proactive back in 2014, 2015 in pushing for uh, wildflower meadows to become a bit of a, a norm across the campus. And we started with a very small area, but it's, it's real thanks to Gail and, and the extended team of the, the biodiversity community to that they, they really pushed through and kind of backed my madness that's in my head in terms of rewilding large tracts of the campus. But this picture of grass, this is, would have been a common site of um, across the campus. If you stood down and looked at the square foot of the ground, this is what you would have seen, um, just a, a green desert of grass. Um, and Gail did uh, some wildflower walks around the campus over the last couple of years and was able to capture some pictures. And this is what she was able to capture. Now, all these pictures, all these pictures are just from, um, none of these are planted as such. These are all in the, in the soil or in the seed base and have grown themselves naturally. So from simply allowing, by tailoring back our, our maintenance practices, we've allowed all these flowers to grow, which is a much more uh, pleasing sight, I suppose, for, for ourselves as humans. But for pollinators and insects, this is, this, is their, this is like a buffet for them. This is the most important food that they want because it is what is natural to the Kildare seed base. And so we want Kildare flowers for Kildare bees and Kildare birds and everything back in. So it's very important that we get the kind of, the choice of plant right, and there's nothing better than harking back to nature. Um, it was great that Gail this year, with uh, help from a student, Stefano, were able to catalog some of the meadows across the campus and see what's growing uh, this year. So as we're going into a kind of our third, third season of growing meadows on a large scale, and um, more and more plants are coming up that take two, three, maybe four years to come up flower. So from going from a, a wildflower meadow that is only 500 meters squared, which was, we were able to nearly name each wildflower individually and, and have an intimate relationship with them. Now we have acres and acres of wildflower meadows that take a lot more walking through and trying to discover what is there. Um, but we're on a learning cur curve and it's, uh, it's really exciting to see the, the meadows being transformed over the last number of years. So uh, since we've taken the decision to reduce our mowing regimes right across the campus, um, as of this summer, we've over 1 million square feet of grassland being managed for biodiversity. Um, so um, 1 million square feet of grassland managed for biodiversity. So if you put that into context, if we stretched out all our meadows into a straight line, we'd have enough to span the width of the country from Dublin to Galway, over 300 kilometres of uh, wildflower meadows. So we feel great and, uh, and uh, it's, it's a privilege to kind of see from where we've gone from our small meadows to these la mar large, large tracts of land that we're really trying to start making a difference and we're trying to improve the campus year on year to make the campus even greener. And we talk about kind of changing our practices and um, looking at things that we could change going forward. So back in 2018, we stopped using any peat on the campus and we started using compost-based media. We stopped the use of all annual bedding. Um, a picture of that can be seen on the left. This was the, our, the, the flower bed at the front of South, South Campus, which was annual bedding, which was an absolute nightmare for us to maintain because it was hungry, it was thirsty, it was, took a lot of weeding, and it did look lovely, but it was very, very time consuming to keep it that way. 
Um, so in 2018, we changed on, our, on, our, on its head. Um, we um, implemented a herbaceous planting mix, which is much more drought tolerant. It doesn't require as much weeding. It's much better for pollinators. And it's going to be done on a three, three or four year cycle now at this stage. Um, so we're looking at each element that we're doing on the campus and we're doing it for pollinators. And the reason why we're promoting pollinators as we feel they are key species, that if we get the pollinators right, we're gonna get the birds in. If we get the birds in, we'll get the mammals in. So we're trying to create this multi-leveled kind of cake of an ecosystem. And if we get the meadows and the plant choices right across the campus, we will get the, the upper cases of the, um, the ecosystem, the, the balance back, I suppose. Oh. Um, so talking about in choices again, like we're looking at choosing the correct plants for the campus. So we're choosing native virus, native first approach. So we're, we're, we're striving away from getting away from these like laurel hedges of a kind of a monoculture society that we're going to have just one hedge that is going to be an instant hedge overnight. We're looking at getting more kind of native Irish hedge, flowering hedges that are much more um, important for biodiversity. Not only do they have flowers for pollinators, but they have berries and fruits that will fruit up in the Christmas to allow our birds to come in and feed and feast on them up in the Christmas. So it's very important to get the right choice of plants as, the, as, as, as we move forward into the future. So if, to quote Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. So from doing all these practices, re reducing our mowing regimes, building, putting in the right plants, putting in the, re reducing our weed killer use and all this sort of stuff, we're finding that uh, our actions are encouraging animals to come back onto the campus, in particular the pollinators. So we felt that we get the infrastructure in place, the pollinators will come and then the birds and the mammals will follow. So we're trying to create that um, healthy balance of food, for the plants, uh, plants for the for the animals and insects to eat, but also to create habitat for them to thrive. So, like the housing crisis we have for humans in this country, the same can be said for our birds and bees. So, we've given them a bit of a helping hand in creating some houses for them to stay on campus. So, the pictures in front of you, we have on the left, we have a picture of our peregrine falcon box, which I'm until I'm I stand, until I'm standing to be corrected, I'm saying it's the highest bird box in the country. It's the top of the spire on South Campus. Uh, then we have a bat box. We have hollowed out bee logs for um, honeybees, wild honeybee swarms to go into. We have on the bottom middle, we have a barn owl box. We four them across the campus. And then we have various different smaller boxes ranging from tree creepers to blue tits to, um, to swallows to swifts, all these sort of different boxes we have across the campus. So we've over 70 now uh, dotted around the campus. Um, so this is this is one of the more exciting boxes. So when we talk about it, if we build it, we will come. Uh, that's a picture of our um, falcon box at the top of the spire, uh, of which we were very excited earlier in the year where we had ravens come in onto the campus. And ravens are one of those kind of species that are really kind of um, just awe-inspiring. Everyone just likes to see a raven. But the ravens went into the peregrine falcon box, they laid some eggs and it was great. We were going to have ravens. And then all of a sudden we got a breeding pair of peregrines come in and kick them out. So we have two very territorial peregrines up the top of the spire at the moment who are watching the box like hawks, uh, pardon the pun, but they are hopefully will have uh, a breeding pair of um, peregrines on South Campus as of next spring. So fingers crossed, keep an eye out at the top of the spire and you might see it if you're on South Campus. Um, so the future of the campus, the future of the campus is expanding rapidly, um, but the future is green. We have two buildings that are coming on stream in the next couple of years, which are ultra modern, A-rated in energy efficiency. But more importantly, the landscape has been chosen for these new builds 
are specific, specifically tailored to be both maximum benefit to biodiversity. Um, so we're choosing a landscape that suits the campus and suits the ecosystem that can there. So previously on bills around the campus, I would have been gifted uh, almost an unwanted child of a landscape that might have been fitting for California or for Portugal or something like that. And there you go, there's your landscape. But now I have a seat at the table, I'm able to tell the architects and the landscape architects what I want to see, what landscape do I want? What is the most benefit to me? So from day one, we're choosing more things. We're choosing, we're not putting down grass. We're gonna put down wildflower meadows. We're choosing native Irish trees. We're choosing hedgerows, native Irish hedgerows instead of laurel hedgerows or privet. We're choosing the right plants on day one to give the most bang for our book. So we are expanding our campus, but we are doing it in a sympathetic manner. We're doing it in a much more um, almost, it's a, a give and take sort of thing. Yes, they're taking some land off us, but it's very exciting to see the landscape being transformed into something new and something that's gonna promote biodiversity going forward. So as I said, we have, instead of grass lawns, we're picking wildflower meadows. Instead of architectural trees, we're choosing native Irish and we're choosing native Irish hedgings. So all planting schemes that I choose across the campus in new bills and ones that we be doing within the grounds department are tailored towards poll pollinators. It's very important for me to get the, the pollinator aspect right and the, the food for the pollinators right, because as I said, they are, they are the the baseline of uh, insects that we need to get to create a very sustainable ecosystem on the campus. So it is ex exciting to see these new, new these, see these new landscapes and how they're going to develop over the the next couple of years. So um, yeah, really exciting to see how they develop. Uh, it's been great to be working with the All Ireland Pollinator Plan over the last couple of years. It's really given um, myself and the Biodiversity Committee and the Green Campus Committee, for that matter, uh, a bit of backup in terms of these mad ideas, which, which are now common practice across the country. Because it's so important that we are doing these things on the Manuk campus, which is great, but we need to be amplifying these right across the country. We're only as good as what your neighbor is doing or what the guy down the road is doing. So I'm implementing all these things, um, Castletown House, OPW sites, uh, Phoenix Park, all these things. When everybody starts doing these actions together, we start to create a much bigger, wider catchment area for uh, making real change going forward. So it's, it's, it's great to be able to stand over the work that we've done and be proud, but um, it's even better when the work that we do is being recognized on a national level. Um, so in the past few years, we were lucky enough to receive our green, our green campus flag, which um, biodiversity was a real core area of getting that flag amongst other areas such as transport, waste, energy, and um, so on, so on. So they are very important. Uh, it was a very important kind of first step to get that green campus flag and kind of build on the work that has been done. Um, and then we built on that in 2019 and became the first university campus in Ireland to win the internationally recognized green flag award for parks and green spaces. And um, so we took the, the, the chance to enter this, this competition to be basically audited every year by judges to come in and make sure that our practices are up to the highest standard. And um, we received a flag in 2019, which was, was fantastic. Um, and then last year, we were lucky enough to be the winner of the Pollinator Award for the All Ireland Pollinator Plan, first university campus to win this award. So while everybody was working from home or uh, and not on the campus, uh, the grounds team were here from day one at ground zero, and we were still making the changes necessary to kind of get these get these awards and these accolades. And it's fantastic for me uh, as a manager to be able to, if somebody comes with me, comes at me with some sort of negativity about why you're doing that, why is the place looking a bit unsightly? Um, I have these kind of accolades to kind of stand over to say, well, actually we're being recognized for doing this and it's important work that needs to be done. So um, yeah, so the Pollinator Award was a great feather in our cap and hopefully we just got judged last week. So fingers crossed we might uh, get the get the flag again in 2021. So 
I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Um, and I look forward to seeing you on the campus in the near future. So uh, I'd like to take in your questions. Thank you very much, Stephen. That was absolutely excellent. Now, I, can we throw this open to the floor? We don't have questions in the chat box, but Stephen will be delighted to answer any questions. So if you want to unmute and um, if you want to raise your hand or if you just, if, if you're familiar with the icons, if not, just speak, please. Uh, Stephen, Joe Murphy here. Stephen, just a quick question. Uh, you know the college farm, is that part of the 183 acres or is that an addition to it? Or no, does that, work? That, that is uh, the additional 400 acres of farmland is not under my wing. It's slightly under my wing, but not really, no. Yep, so there is 400 acres in the actual farm, just uh, just doing more. a little bit of history in the town or whatever. Yeah, and, more, uh, more, more or less now, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay, thanks Stephen. Hi Stephen, I actually have a, two questions for you if you don't mind. Um, very interesting presentation and well done on the awards. They are very well deserved. I work in the university and take great thrill and walking around and looking at all the wildflowers. I'm just wondering when you were talking about the peregrine falcon box, have you any um, notion of putting a live camera up there or is that something that would be even yeah. thought about? Yeah, we have a camera up there. Oh, you do already? Oh, fantastic. And my second thing, because um, I work in the science building, so obviously I uh, have been seeing before I came out the big building that's going up in front of us. Is there any plan for planting additional trees for the ones that have been taken down for buildings? Yep. So we have two, uh, two different approaches in that respect. So we have the policy of one comes down, tree will be planted in this place. So we will have, uh, they're, actually, they're actually in the yard at the moment, just uh, healed in. So we're waiting them to be grow to be a bit more mature before we put them out. Um, fortunately with the drought, a lot of people planted trees last March and they all died over the summer because of, of the drought. So we, we, we like to plant kind of just before kind of Christmas, uh, autumn time, because we feel they get a bit, bit better of a start. Um, so they'll be going into the new lands over to the West. Um, I think there's about 350 of them. And then we also have um, the landscape of that new building. There is, um, I think there could be, I, I, I could be, it could be up to sixty trees going in there as well, uh, mm -hmm. all native Irish. So yeah, we 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 won't take a tree down unnecessarily, and we will plant in there a place. Brilliant! That's fantastic. Thanks, Stephen. No problem. Anybody else? Yeah, uh, Stephen, um, I'm Tyke McIntyre. I'm an environmental psychologist. Look, it's a pleasure to, to see you uh, live on screen. But having um, started on campus in January, and I have, haven't have been to my office yet, but I've had the joy of bringing my kids around the campus. And you know, we, we've seen, uh, you know, grasshopper squirrels and some beautiful flora and fauna. And my kids do like the orchard a lot, so I can't say that they won't be climbing trees. Um, ju just in, in terms of mapping you know the impact because I think this is something you've done really well. Can we can we go a step further and maybe la map this to the UN SDGs because that's probably something the college is certainly going to have to look at. So is that an area that we could go down and say, okay, here are the SDGs that we're contributing to in terms of you know uh, how we're managing the the green space? Yeah, so we we are linking it to a certain extent through the green campus. Um, probably could be doing more. Um, I'm very much of the opinion that if we wait to get all our ducks in a row um, to get everything kind of lined up, I'm kind of doing this at a very accelerated pace and I'm trying to, we're learning as we're going, um, but yes, I would love to get more kind of linking of that, but if, if I've waited for the relevant kind of departments and things to everything to join in, we'd still be spraying, uh, maintaining the campus <laughs> in the old ways. Yes. So yeah. Um, yeah. trying to get kind of joined up thinking can be quite slow in some respects, but, um, and I move at a quite a fast fate pace, unfortunately. So what yeah, else? honestly, let's hope we catch up. So as departments, you probably know, we've all been asked to look at the SDGs and all our modules. Yeah. So look, we're running an environmental psychology master's and hopefully we'll have students be able to, 
contribute to to the program that you run uh, and and help in some way. Thanks. Keep up the good work. Cheers. Thank you. And we have two questions in the chat box. I'll take those now from Laura. I was wondering, what are the plans for the wall guard near the orchard on the old campus? Thank you. Uh, yeah, so that's the, the junior garden. Um, we've had serious staff constraints over the last number of years and our gardener has retired over the last number of years and hasn't been replaced, unfortunately. So um, we will be revamping that garden when staffing levels get to a more adequate level. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a bit worse for wear at the moment. Um, we are looking at kind of introducing maybe a volunteering program maybe in springtime next year. Um, but yeah, we're looking at kind of making a bit more um, labor intensive and kind of take out some of the plants that are causing a bit of grief and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, we all, I only actually have kind of six guys to manage 181 acres. So we have 25 acres each or a bit more to, I don't know, it's up to 30 now, um, to maintain on a daily basis. So as you can manage, imagine it's, it's, it's a daunting task. Thanks for that. And uh, some of you may know from going to the garden, there's a lovely sculpture in the garden, which it commemorates um, uh, the professor of history there here, Monsignor Corish, who is now deceased, but he wrote the history of Maynooth. Um, the next question, Stephen, is from Eduardo and is saying, great to see this progress. Congratulations. I, I was wondering if you take any proactive approach in managing the wildflower meadows to prevent the number of some particular plants taking over and becoming almost the most prominent species and dominating the landscape, for example, ragwort, sorrel, etc. Thank you. Yeah, so um, we just roll our sleeves up in terms of ragwort and we get out and pick it all by hand. So a million square foot and pull it all by hand. You can you can think how hard that is, but we're doing that at the moment. Um, in terms of other kind of... One man's, one man's weed is another man's flower, so it's very hard to kind of pick what is the choice plant, which one do you want? Like I was walking through the, cat, the, the meadows there Oh, two months ago and um, one person said to me uh, take out all the docks because they're unsightly and they're invasive blah 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 uh, and then I walked 10 meters up and then another member of staff said oh leave the docks because they're good for the birds so it's kind of very much a balancing act and um, at the moment we're only actively taking out the noxious weed which is the ragwort and um, we don't have kind of issue of being bombarded with as a sole kind of plant yet we're only in kind of year three now of our meadows so maybe five ten years down the line that could be a bigger problem but uh look i i'm in constant contact with other kind of supervisors and managers of large estates who have meadows for the last 10 15 years and we i i, I just simply ask them how they do it and it's by the end of the day it's just going and kind of manually doing a lot of this work unfortunately but I, I'm up to the challenge. Great, thank you, Stephen. Now for Nisha. Um, hi, Stephen, can you recommend any good resources to help us make similar improvements in our own gardens at home? So I would say the go-to guide and the Bible that you have to go by is the National Biodiversity Data Centre website. And they have done really, really good work in Categorize, categorizing all their actions into specific groups of people. So whether you're a county council, whether you're a university campus, whether you're a business, whether you're a homeowner, whether you've got apartments, all these things, they have individual tailored um, actions that you can take in your own garden, very simply put and very uh, easily kind of read. So I'd say National Biodiversity Data Center um, and get on kind of social media, Facebook, Twitter, they're great, like pop a question onto one of those people, uh, one of those sites, um, any of the ones with National Biodiversity Data Center and there's loads of people that will get back to you. Thanks very much for that. Now I know you have your hand up. I'm sorry, I don't know your first name. Uh, do you want to unmute and um, speak? Sorry, Patricia, uh, is my name. Um, thanks very much, Stephen. I just want to commend you and the grounds team on what a fabulous job you've done. Absolutely excellent. 
Um, and I just wanted to, um, I don't want to take over Stevens, but you didn't mention it earlier. And it's just in response maybe to what Tyg was saying and a couple of other questions there by Nisha, what we can do. Um, we've opened up an edible garden as well on campus. So Stephen has been working with a working group um, with myself and a few other uh, staff and uh, people in the local community. And we've opened up an edible garden or created this edible garden at the back of our own house. And certainly the SDGs and everything are going to be tied into that. And there's going to be lots of events over the next year. So just watch that space for anyone who does want to get involved. I just wanted to say that. Yep, thanks. Thanks, uh, Patricia. Yeah, it's a uh, it's relatively new thing, the, the edible garden. And it's... Uh, We've numerous projects kind of coming on stream now in the next while that we'll be kind of hopefully promoting and when the students come back. Um, but yeah, watch this space. It's a, it's, a, it's a lovely space. And Patricia, I think you've partially answered Eduardo's question. Um, have the university considered any plans to provide information on using wild plants as food and educate the population while doing so? Is that part of the plan, um, Patricia? Yes, um, just very briefly, yeah, we have the planting regime that we've actually incorporated into the garden. Anybody can walk through and they can and uh, use, take some of the produce there and certainly get involved. And we're going to be hosting a lot of workshops um, along with Stephen and the grounds team, educating um, both the local wider community and Maynooth University staff and students and to encourage active engagement in Stephen and the Ground Team's plan and the Green Campus initiatives and certainly the SDG goals. So it's uh, something to look out for, um, and, I, you know, and watch that. There'll be information sent out on a monthly basis on forthcoming events in the Green Shoots for that. And I think Stephen is going to be, you, you contribute to that regularly anyway. Um, so it's just something maybe for... Um, information to be disseminated there. Yeah, the, the, green, the green shoots is a great way of kind of seeing what's on the campus and also the Minute Green Campus kind of uh, social media channels, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, they would be kind of tweeting or promoting any of the things that we might be doing or trying to do. Um, and uh, yeah, it's that, that's where I'd say kind of go look for that information. And Eduardo, the last part of your question is the campus open to the public to visit. You can walk around the campus at the moment. You can't, for example, uh, go into specific buildings. But yes, and it's wonderful. The grounds are wonderful for walking around. And it's certainly a very pleasant hour or more. Um, OK, anybody else with questions? If not, and we've had a lot of questions there, Stephen, so thank you very much for answering them. I, I'd like to thank everybody for coming today. You will be sent out a form for feedback from Elaine. And I'd like to thank Stephen particularly for giving us such a brilliant, uh, inspiring talk on, the, on our beautiful grounds. So privileged to have here. And I'd like to finish by thanking Elaine for organising the event today. And hopefully um, we will see more of you again at lunchtime tomorrow. Bye now. And uh, Ty, thanks for the um, congratulations to Stephen. And thanks, Stephen. It was brilliant. So I had lots of... Um, thanks, thanks, everybody. Yeah, that's great. Thank you.